All right, I would say we start. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone uh, to our webinar on AI assistance for a post-COVID world. Um, awesome to have you all here. Um, one thing that I want to say uh, right at the start, you might uh, see a lot of uh, Stacy uh, people here in this webinar, and uh, I can assure you they are not bots. Uh, we just had a little uh, little uh, thing going on with the Zoom uh, webinar invite, um, which is why everyone or a lot of people are called uh, Stacy here. Um, so I promise you they are not bots, although the topic of today is, of course, about bots and AI assistance, um, but they are actually uh, real humans <laughs> behind this. Um, perfect. Cool. Yeah, so we have uh, three speakers today. Um, I'm one of them. My name is Alex, uh, one of the co-founders of Raza, um, and I'm also the host for tonight here. Um, and I'll walk you through the slides um, at the beginning. And then we have uh, awesome Maddie uh, from, from our team speaking, um, as well as Will, um, who has been a contributor with Raza. And I'm really excited uh, to hear uh, what they both have been up to with the examples that they're giving um, about the use cases that we've seen in the last couple of months. Um, and so we kick things off uh, with a quick introduction um, and the welcome um, and then a little bit uh, just of context for everyone on uh, what Raza is and what we are doing here. Um, and I'll, I'll promise to keep this short, um, although I could talk about this uh, for a very long time, always, um, always really excited. Um, and then we talk a little bit about like the kind of overall things that we've seen in the market um, in the last couple of months, ever since um, COVID-19 um, started um, yeah, spreading across the world. Um, then Maddie will be talking specifically about some COVID-19 assistance um, that people build with Raza. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll be talking about how to run remote studies using chatbots in a post-COVID world. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a Q&A. Just a few housekeeping things. Um, so I would ask you all to uh, mute yourself um, and stay muted during the webinar. Um, today's presentation will be recorded um, and we're gonna send you an email afterwards um, with that recording. If you have questions, uh, please just use the Zoom chat um, and pop them in there. Um, at the end, uh, we'll go through them um, and answer them in the Q&A. And we're also gonna send out a short survey um, after the webinar, which is really just for us also to learn um, how you liked it and how we can improve um, for the next one. Cool, awesome. So I don't know exactly like uh, what your background is on, on Raza. Um, if you're like a developer, if you're like an executive who's just like heard about Raza the first time um, or anywhere in between, I guess. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone is, is on the same page. Um, so our mission here at Raza is to empower all makers to create AI assistants that work for everyone. Um, so what does it mean? <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of different angles to, to looking at this mission. Um, but the key thing is really that we believe that AI assistants have tremendous like power to make really like any piece of software accessible to any user. And so when I think about like software um, and think about like websites and like web applications or so, and if you think about my dad, who's now like 65 or something like this, um, he wouldn't really go to like a website like Skyscanner or booking.com and just quickly book something there. It's just like not his style, right? And it's not that he doesn't like intellectually get it. It's more that it takes him some time to understand the UI and it's not really what he used to. So he actually still calls up like a travel agent. Um, but with conversation, I, I, at least the overall premise is that you can actually make a person like my dad communicate with a computer um, in a way the same way as he would like talk to the travel agent. And that's really, kind of we think extremely powerful because it would mean that not only like something like Skyscanner or Booking.com would be more accessible to people like my dad, but it also means that other like expert pieces of software, like for example, Adobe Photoshop also are more accessible to other people. And we think that's awesome. Um, but then the big challenge with this is that in order to get there, you also have to make sure um, that not only like a small group of people um, who are experts in machine learning or NLP can build those types of applications, but also everyone uh, and ideally like every maker can possibly like contribute to something like this, which is why we, we started Raza as a company. And the way how we want to get there is really through like building what we call like the standard infrastructure layer for conversational AI. You can think of it as like a bit like the HTML of conversational AI. Um, and we do this through like open source, which is a core part um, of what we've done ever since we got started. 
um, but also through nurturing our community of makers. So like if you're a developer um, and you've been using Raza, you probably know this, that we have uh, tons of like people worldwide um, using Raza, like giving each other feedback, helping each other um, out and really making sure that they share best practices um, amongst teams and amongst um, folks that have been building conversational AI. But also one key part is really making sure that um, we ship applied research because I'm sure you all follow like the news on NLP um, and the big advances that have been made over the last couple of years um, from like BERT to GPT-3 and all of those things. Um, and that's super exciting. And we think, of course, like, you know, this field is moving so fast and a lot of like advances have happened, but then what does it really mean to your like real life application? What does it mean to your assistant? Um, and we also see ourselves as like bridging that gap um, between research and bringing that into an application and assistant. Um, we started like approximately like three and a half years ago or so, and it was really just my co-founder, um, Alan and me, um, sitting together in a kitchen um, in Berlin, trying to build a chatbot ourselves. So that's how we got started. Realized that a lot of the tools that have been around back in the days um, didn't really work for us. Um, and then really just like went on GitHub and open sourced uh, one of the first, uh, like well, the first product um, that was called Raza NLU. And since then there was like, as I said, three and a half years ago, I've seen just tremendous growth all over the world. Um, and really like have been just amazed by how many great community contributions we've gotten um, ever since and like how widely Raza has been adopted uh, from like, you know, small companies, like single developer projects, all the way to like the largest companies in the world um, that are building customer facing um, assistance with Raza. And we are really, really just really grateful about the contributors that we have now um, for over 450 um, who has helped like with pretty much anything from like tiny fixes on like the documentation, fixing a typo, uh, fixing like smaller things all the way to like major projects that people merged in over time. And we're really happy uh, just about like how, how like active and open this community is. Um, so thank you for that. Everyone who uh, here today is a contributor um, and everyone who's not, um, we are always making and trying to make it easier uh, to contribute to Raza. Um, make sure to check out uh, our website on that as well, um, which we can also post here later in the chat. Um, cool. Last but not least, um, on Raza, we have an amazing community showcase. And so that's really like a great place to get some inspiration for what's possible with conversational AI today. Um, but at the same time, it also is something where you can like go and show off your project um, to other people. Um, so I'd highly encourage you to check this out as well. Um, we're going to share a link in the chat um, to that page. And it's really just like a good place to, you know, just browse what other people are building. Um, and it's really anything from, again, like, as I said, like hobby projects all the way to like assistants uh, running in like uh, the largest companies of the world. Cool. Um, I wanted to spend a couple of more minutes um, before Maddie and, and Will are taking over here. Um, just to give you a bit of sense for like what we've seen in the last couple of um, months. And I, I think, I mean, one, one important uh, point is I think that um, this is really everything that happened with COVID-19 um, across the world is really more than just a health crisis in many ways, right? So um, we've, we've seen that, um, I think, firsthand in, in, in many cases as well in our community. Um, and I hope you all safe, your, your families are safe. Um, and I hope you all are in a spot where you, you haven't been impacted as much. Um, I personally think a lot about this um, in the context of what we are doing at Raza as well with like automation and um, pretty much in, in the end, um, like, you know, AI, I think, as a, as, a, as, a, as a wider field is something that um, happens and is in many ways also inevitable, but I think has also been accelerated in many ways through the last couple of months. And I think that's something important to think about in the context of um, what happens in, in this world and, and how we can also as a company contribute to that. Um, and I think other challenges that we've seen, um, of course, like economic uncertainty, if you, if you read like the news in pretty much any country in the world, um, there's a lot of unemployment, um, a lot of um, just like growth being either stalled or like um, really like dipping. 
um, going back to like five years ago or something like this from a GDP growth standpoint. Um, so that's of course like a huge topic, um, housing insecurity um, we've seen across many countries as well. Um, but also really like access to a lot of, um, like as, as, as a lot of um, inaccurate data um, and really staying up to date on, on everything has been a challenge for a lot of folks. Um, many, many others. Um, and I think what's, what's really important to say is that um, this all you know, cannot only be solved by AI assistants, of course. And um, there's a lot of other things that, that play into all of this. Um, but also for a lot of people, and I mean, we are a good, good example of that, like every team in the world, um, your working conditions also change a lot, right? So we've seen um, a lot of our like, community members uh, working from home um, with their kids, um, with their families, um, which of course for many people is also a big challenge. And so, um, you know, there's, it's kind of a bit of a crazy world that we're living in. And, and as I said uh, a few minutes ago, I hope you're all safe um, and uh, you're, you're doing well. From a like high level standpoint, back to like conversational AI, um, a lot has changed there as well, right? So if you if you just look at um, the the needs of users um, and and kind of what happened over the last couple of months, is that just a lot of the conversations have had like pretty much moved all digitally, right? So I mean because a lot of uh, places had like lockdowns, uh, shops were closed, um, more and more like workloads have been moving online. Um, and so that, of course, is something that impacted AI assistants in, in many ways uh, very dramatically. And so if you look at um, like legacy call centers, for example, right, um, a lot of them have really seen um, huge challenges in the last couple of months. Um, pretty much if you, if you look at uh, any industry, um, everyone got much, much more calls, like more questions, and not only in healthcare, right, like in, in pretty much all industries, um, people are uncertain about you know whatever this industry offers so like if you if you look at um specifically like healthcare health insurance or so right a lot of customers had many questions about like how COVID-19 affects their health insurance plans um you know is like in in different countries but like is a is a test covered and like all of those questions right like lots of uncertainty um but also at the same time people needed uh, and still need um up-to-date information um, about the coronavirus um, in their communities and like pretty much how you can get help. Um, and I think I can, I can probably say this, like it's a lot of, of most, almost no government I think in the world was really prepared for something like this, right? So a lot of um, things have also been very ad hoc and um, just lots of like explanation needed um, because it's something that, that was very new to everyone. Um, but then at the same time, as I mentioned, like just literally any industry you can think of, there was something changing through COVID-19. And so um, my favorite story here is uh, from one of our customers, a large retailer um, in Europe. Um, they pretty much um, got a lot of calls and like a lot of messages online asking if toilet paper is in stock. And so uh, depending on, on where you are in the world, um, I, I was uh, at the time in Germany um, a lot of places really ran out of toilet paper, right? So I can totally relate to asking this question. Um, and so what they ended up doing is um, they saw so many people asking for this that they actually built um, action into their assistant um, that calls their API um, for, for like the, the, the different locations um, and checks if it's really in stock. And I think that's something um, really powerful example of like how conversationally I can really help um, make, make things easier for everyone. Um, because if you think about it, right, if you, if you just need to buy toilet paper and you go into 20 different stores, that's, of course, like a big health risk um, in the world of like COVID-19. And so if you can help people know exactly where to go to get toilet paper, um, that actually makes things easier for everyone. And, and I think that's a cool example of like how this all um, can, can play together and, and make lives easier and, in fact, healthier probably. Um, I brought three other examples um, just to give you a bit of sense for like what we've seen um, in this in this COVID-19 world. Um, and one is uh, from NIB. Um, it's a health insurance um, based in Australia. Um, and I think it's also like just a great example of like how a product team has been responding really fast uh, to these changing needs um, from their customers. Um, and, and so really what they discovered is that the COVID-19 topic 
is necessarily not like an isolated topic. So it actually overlapped with a lot of different intents in their assistant. And so they ended up um, like kind of improving their assistant um, with that data that came in. Um, I'm, I'm, if you're like following Raza, I'm sure you've heard about like conversation driven development. Um, pretty much the idea is to learn from real conversations um, and then improve the assistant over time. And that's what they did. Um, and then actually increase the deflection rate from 48% to 63% uh, just in March. Um, if you're interested in that topic, uh, we have a really cool talk here from Brian, um, who's the design lead, uh, who talked at our developer conference a couple of months ago. Um, and I think we're gonna share these slides um, with you anyways afterwards. So make sure to, to check out that. Um, there's another cool example from PicPay. Um, PicPay is a Brazilian company um, and they're really like the, the kind of largest uh, payment app in Brazil. Um, and so when COVID-19 started, uh, the Brazilian government actually selected them as the payment app uh, through which people can get emergency aid funds paid out. Um, and so within 10 days, uh, PicPay actually built an assistant um, with Raza and deployed it online and then had, had like lots of people accessing that uh, to, to get this emergency aid. Um, I think also a cool example of how quickly you can build an assistant that actually really delivers value to people. And then the last example is um, from uh, Vocinity. Um, and so they pretty much helped automating um, an outreach and a survey collection um, for COVID-19 um, through a phone example. I think that's also a great, um, just other example of like how you can not use always like text-based um, but actually also voice-based and, and phone-based conversational AI. Um, and um, just, I think, a cool way to, to really collect data. It's actually something that we've not only seen um, with them, but a lot of other folks. Um, and yeah, again, like in a, in a world where, um, you know, there's so much uncertainty um, as well as like just, you know, people don't have enough data to really make the right decisions in, in health organizations. Um, collecting more of that in an automated way like this um, is a great example of, of conversational AI. So yeah, I mean, you've seen a bunch of those things already, but I think when, when we look at this um, as a company, um, the, the three major things that we've been seeing conversational AI benefiting is really that it like decreased the burdens um, of a call center, um, especially in times also where call centers have been closed through lockdown as well, right? I mean, um, a lot of countries um, had to close their, their offices and everything as well. Um, and so, you know, if you're like call center workers are not able to get to work anymore, what do you do? And if you don't have the infrastructure um, to support them working from home, then you're pretty much screwed in many ways, right? So, I mean, and, and I think in that case, conversation I can help. Um, at the same time, it really also helps um, for less tech savvy users. I mean, I mentioned my dad earlier, um, who was who's 65. Um, to really have like an intuitive interface um, to get important information. Um, and then, as I said already, um, adopting to like new user behavior. Um, if you imagine like this retailer having just a website um, and there's no way for users to add anything there and like make their specific requests, you would never know that they've been really searching for toilet paper, right? And so in this case, um, I think it's a great example of how you can leverage um, conversations that people have with an assistant um, and using then conversation driven development. Cool, and of course, I mean, Raza, um, and if you're more interested in that, um, just, just ping us, um, can help with, with all of that. Um, so Raza is like multi-channel, um, you can deploy it on your um, text apps, like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, SMS, um, but also really like on, on uh, call centers, um, as well as like Google Home and, and all of those places. Um, it's multilingual, which I think is also an important part um, in, in almost all countries these days, um, especially if you look at the US. Um, and, and so that's been a big advantage of Raza, but then of course also that it's like running 24 seven and uh, you don't need to worry about that. Um, cool. Awesome, so um, that's it. And I would hand over uh, to Maddie. And if you have any questions uh, for me, um, I'm here at the end. Awesome, great, thanks, uh, Alex, for that. Um, okay, uh, so hello everyone, thanks for joining us uh, and it's great to be here. 
Um, and Maddie, uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the themes that we've been seeing recently with uh, the COVID-19 projects that we've been helping with, um, how we've been helping these individuals and teams, and um, I'll also talk about some next steps in terms of what you can do if you're feeling inspired uh, and if you feel like contributing. So one of the first themes that we've been seeing, um, as we'll see on the next slide, is the usage of conversational AI to disseminate information. So you know, during a pandemic, people are often in need of information, you know, reliable information, right? And they can't do too little and risk getting everyone infected or do too much and overburden medical and healthcare systems. So reliable information and accurate information in a language that people can understand in a format that's accessible is extremely important, right? So we've been seeing a lot of individuals and teams build chatbots that answer questions about the pandemic, you know, things like what's COVID-19, um, what are some of the symptoms, what should I do to be safe, you know, how can I prevent the spread of the disease and so forth. And another thing that we've been seeing is using conversational AI to scale processes. Um, you've heard Alex talk about some of our customers being overburdened at this time, like healthcare companies that offer health insurance and other benefits, getting a lot of customer questions about the status of their benefits or getting questions about their coverage. Um, and we've seen companies augment their current processes with always ready, always on channels and automate simple conversations, something that a human doesn't, doesn't have to handle. So with, with using conversational AI, they were able to automate a significant portion of their calls or processes and help serve their customers better. You know, we've seen companies scale their telemedicine capabilities by using chatbots to assess risk or stratify risk to look at symptoms and analyze them and then hand off to humans if it's something that a human needs to take a look at. Or, you know, if they're fine and they haven't been in contact with anyone with COVID-19, they don't have any symptoms, they can just continue staying safe. So this way, medical teams and ops teams are able to handle cases that need their attention and everyone is still able to get some kind of attention in a way that's scalable. Um, and at Raza, we've been helping not just our customers um, that we'll see on our next slide, but also our community and everyone interested in building COVID-19 conversational AI projects. Uh, we've devoted a portion of our time to answering questions, um, assisting with the design and development of these assistants and connecting people that are working on similar projects. We've also devoted a page on our website to list all of these COVID-19 resources together, which we'll take a look at in a little bit. Um, so folks can check them out and to use them or to build on top of these resources. So one of the first projects that we've assisted with is the WHO, the World Health Organization COVID-19 Health Alert Service. Um, it answers questions uh, and facts about the disease. It's available on Facebook Messenger in English, French, Arabic, uh, Spanish, Swahili, and other languages too. Um, it has over 20 million concurrent users. And the WHO says that, you know, of course, it has the potential to reach 4.2 billion people, right? So it's a health alert service or a chatbot that answers basic questions about COVID-19. Um, things like what it is, how to stay safe, how people can get help, and, and so forth. And it's multilingual, um, which is you know, really important to, to our community and to, to us at Raza. And another interesting project that came out of the Raza community was uh, an open source API that finds nearby testing centers. So if folks are looking for a testing center nearby, they'd ask a chatbot right, that connects them to this API and it can tell them where to get tested because it would pull up locations based on your state. This is something available only in the US right now, um, but the source code is, is, is available and open for anyone that wants to apply it to another country or to another geolocale. So let's actually play the video and take a quick look at how it works. Um, and the RASA community member that worked on this also developed a UI for it, as you'll see. So you ask it, a question about where you can get tested. It asks you where you live. And then depending on the state, it pulls up various locations and I'm sure you could build on top of it, right? Um, I think we're getting a question in the chat here. Yeah, uh, as of right now, I think this project is text input only, uh, but I'm sure you can add a, a voice integration if you're feeling inspired. Um, 
and we'll provide a link to all of these resources later on. So that might be something uh, if you have time and if you're interested to do. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, uh, and, and so another project that we've seen um, is, so one of the things that this pandemic is causing and, and exacerbating is economic hardships, which Alex referenced. A lot of folks from all over the world and especially in the US are facing layoffs, furloughs and evictions. Um, so someone from our community worked on a rent and an eviction FAQ assistant. Um, again, this is available only in the US and it answers questions about tenant rights. So right now, if you're following the news in the US, you'll find that we're facing an eviction crisis during the economic stresses caused by the pandemic and caused by other things as well. So this assistant provides reliable information on things like, you know, how much of a rent increase is legal, um, what makes a, a place, an apartment or a house uninhabitable, um, what are some examples of landlord landlady, I think owner is probably more inclusive, so I should probably change that on the slide. So, you know, what are some examples of owner intimidation, right? And is it legal? If it's not legal, what are some steps that I can take to combat this and so forth? So, um, uh, Francis that worked on this assistant is also trying to team up with some, some lawyers and some pro bono legal teams. So, you know, if you find an example of something that's not legal, you know, it will connect you to resources that you can take advantage of that are free so you can take action. Um, this is open source and it's a work in progress, but it's a service that answers questions about things that are very relevant at the moment, because like I said, in the US, we're facing an eviction crisis and governmental institutions are planning to implement a moratorium on evictions actually. Um, so this is something that scales. So you're not calling your local governmental institutions and staying on hold or not being able to reach them. Um, it disseminates information uh, and it's always on and it is relevant for what we're seeing at the moment. I think we have a question here. How do you ensure that the answers are legally vetted? Yeah, that's a really great question, right? And I think that um, is, is a great point about making sure that you're adding information to your chatbot uh, that is is accurate and reliable not just with like legal data but also medical data and other data that has to be that's you know really sensitive and that has the impact um, that you want and it can also you know maybe potentially do some harm um, so i a way to do that is to make sure that you're reaching out to subject matter experts to make sure that that's actually accurate uh, and, and make sure that your data is um, updated from time to time to, to make sure that it's still correct. Um, you know, we're helping um, with, you know, building of this assistant and some other, you know, technical capabilities, questions about our tech stack and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's very important to make sure that your information is legally vetted and accurate for sure, especially if people are using it to get some um, information. Uh, okay, which pipeline configuration is better in terms of prediction and answering according to the intents and utterances? So yeah, I think we're going to take some of these questions towards the end um, of the webinar, so we'll be sure to come back to that question. Um, okay, um, so a lot of these projects uh, so far that we've seen with the tenants' rights assistance, uh, with the API, with the World Health Organization Health Alert Service are individual chatbots or APIs that tell you specific information. And on the next slide, we'll see that we've also seen platforms that allow you to build bots. And we've also supported low code platforms that quickly bootstrap Raza FAQ bots. So if you wanted to build something really quickly with UI, with backend services integration, integration with Raza services, um, you know, and a template that allows you to build a bot to hold simple conversations. So this isn't something that's, you know, truly a contextual assistant, but it's an FAQ assistant that can help you answer a few basic um, questions and hold simple conversations. You could use a platform like this that's open source that can help you get started fairly quickly, right? And Flock Crisis Center is not just for COVID-19 bots, uh, but also other crises or use cases that need simple FAQ assistance. So you can catch um, Ude, who's also a member of our community, you can catch his talk about the Flock Crisis Center on YouTube. He presented um, at L3AI, which was our conference earlier this year. 
Um, and in addition to supporting these and other projects, we've also been connecting community members on our forum. So we posted about this a few months ago, telling our community that we've been, you know, trying to help in a way that we know how. We've also seen some incredible engagement for our community. Um, on our next slide, you'll see that folks have been sharing, you know, assistance and projects that they've been building. Um, from, you know, so Brandon from Argentina has been working on a COVID-19 FAQ assistant. Um, and, you know, he provided some information on how it was built and some questions about how, you know, he needed help on making sure the NLU um, was, was a little bit more accurate. And on the next slide, you'll see another project where Tomas talked about this API uh, that we actually entered onto our um, website as well. Um, and so he was sharing these resources, you know, that he built that people can take advantage of. And, and on the next slide, you'll see that folks have been answering each other's questions, helping each other out, and overall just like really incredible support from the community, which is always great to see. Um, we're really passionate about our community at Raza, and we truly believe that the way to contribute meaningfully or improve conversational AI as a whole, right, is to build something and share that with others. Tell them about it, which you'll see on our next slide. Talk to them about it you know, help them answer questions, or if you're feeling unstuck, ask questions, you know, on our forum or other forums so that others can learn and improve too, right? Um, because the community is really at the heart of, of what we do and uh, building something in public, sharing it with others, asking questions and learning from others is really one of the best ways you can continue to improve and, and learn from everyone. Um, we also have a page on our website, like I mentioned, where we share information on COVID-19 related projects. So if you've seen something interesting or if you're building something really cool, please reach out to us, you know, send me an email or a DM and we'll be happy to learn more. Um, on, the, on the next slide, you'll see that that's the page there. And I think Stacy also posted a link to this page on our, on our chat. So feel free to take a look and reach out if, uh, you have something that you want to share and we'd be happy to, to learn more. So with that, I know I've talked about a few projects, but there's another really interesting and relevant project that we're going to learn about now. And I'd like to introduce you to Will Kearns, who's a PhD student at the University of Washington. Um, Will built a wellness study to understand the mental well-being of people, you know, during this time. And it's a really interesting and beneficial project. And I'm really excited to learn more about it. So with that, I'll hand it off to Will. And thanks, Will, for being here and for, for being generous with your time. Uh, thanks, thanks, Maddie. Um, as Maddie mentioned, I'm Will Kearns, a PhD candidate at the University of Washington, uh, where I develop methods that enhance the ability for humans and machines to show empathy uh, by representing and tracking the mental state of uh, individuals in a multi-turn dialogue. Um, this research has applications in patient relationship management, mental health therapy, and as well as augmentative and alternative communication technology. Uh, today, I'm here to share with you recent joint work with the University of Cambridge on Quora, a COVID-19 wellness study. Uh, and next slide. I'll, uh, so for the COVID-19, uh, Maddie and Alex have already shared several of the situations people are in with this. Um, I would just like to add that this is, uh, we've seen increased anxiety and stress across uh, all dem demographics. Uh, this includes single and elderly people living alone who've reported increased anxiety and social isolation, as well as married couples who have seen anxiety increase from 19 to 39% as they're adjusting to working from home and uh, lack of childcare and needing to homeschool their children. Uh, people are of course also concerned with their health and safety and uh, these burdens uh, uh, are amplified for individuals experiencing social injustice. Um, so while I'll be describing our work on understanding the effects on COVID-19, the results are relevant to a number of other use cases, uh, including pulse surveys uh, listed here, but also patient and customer satisfaction surveys and, and many more. Uh, so we implemented a simple intervention to monitor well-being uh, by adopting the UK National Office of Statistics well-being questions. Those are the Likert type questions here. And supplementing these with additional free response questions to contextualize the results. Uh, we also included a weekly reflection uh, as a brief intervention to help participants reflect on their feelings. 
and also work on concrete plans to improve their situation. Um, so in our initial message each day, we explain the scale used for Likert type questions uh, with one being not at all and 10 being completely. This way, this information didn't need to be included in each of the messages, uh, which, which made the keeping the intent of the bot messages clear. Uh, instead, we include a queue of either uh, one to 10 in parentheses or a pencil icon to indicate free response versus Likert type questions. Um, for the next slide, uh, we, um, uh, we wanted to implement a simple, um, Alex, can you uh, advance? Oh, sorry, uh, back one. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it was important to use SMS for this study because uh, while 87% of adults aged 18 and older have a smartphone, uh, this number is deceiving as smartphone adoption is near universal in younger adults, whereas in elderly populations, which are at particular risk when it comes to COVID-19, only 71% of uh, them have a smartphone, uh, which leaves 29% of adults over 65 uh, without a smartphone. Uh, to address this, we developed a custom ZipWhip connector, uh, which is a, a SMS provider uh, to handle text messaging. Uh, this was a simple process with uh, using Raza uh, as they have a custom channel um, um, uh, uh, option within the library itself. Uh, and that took about four hours of work. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't make use of, of our custom channel uh, because ZipWhip didn't uh, support international text. Uh, so we did need to hot swap to uh, Twilio uh, at the beginning of the study, which was also a relatively simple process. Um, we implemented uh, our daily and weekly check-in forms uh, as custom form actions in Raza. Uh, in order to support Likert type questions, uh, we actually needed to make a, a modification to the validation uh, method uh, for custom forms uh, that I show here. Uh, because uh, we're essentially trying to extract a number for each one of the uh, Likert um, uh, responses. And so um, that would cause an auto-filling issue uh, with the line here that shows about uh, extracting other slots. Uh, so we just made that modification. Um, and then uh, the daily and weekend, weekly check-ins, which used free text, uh, we were able to handle uh, using the uh, standard customizations through Raza. Uh, one of the benefits of Raza is that the default pipeline uh, includes a number of statistical machine learning components that enable free-flowing conversation. However, dialogue systems have been used for decades to administer surveys, including in healthcare. So for our use case, we chose to keep, keep it simple, uh, which has benefits for both cost and control of the user experience. Uh, so we remove all statistical components from the policy, uh, as you see over here. So we included a uh, memoization policy, which essentially uh, memorizes the, uh, the, uh, the um, states of the dialogue. There's a mapping policy, uh, uh, which it directly maps intents to actions of the bot, a form policy, which was the most heavily used, and then a fallback for if uh, the responses of the user weren't recognized. Uh, so reprompting the user for, uh, for them to uh, retry their response. Uh, and so this allowed us to uh, train and run the models on a T2 small cluster, uh, where embedding based models require either T3 medium and T3 large clusters in order to train and run the models. Uh, so we deployed this cluster using Docker Compose and included HTTPS for privacy uh, by modifying the Nginx uh, server. Uh, and all code for this project is available at the repository at the, the link here, uh, and, uh, which also includes additional symptom tracking functionality as well. Uh, so I put together some of our initial results to share. Uh, we're currently working on completing the analysis and plan to submit the, a paper at later this month. Uh, but here I'm going to share uh, some word clouds. Uh, so uh, the word cloud here was uh, in response to what caused you the most anxiety today. Um, and I'm showing this one here with raw frequencies for comparison. Uh, but using raw frequencies, there's not much difference between topics discussed uh, with regard to what caused hope and what caused anxiety. Um, there was a large emphasis on family and friends uh, in both hope and anxiety, um, and also an emphasis on work. Um, compare this to uh, the version of the word cloud computed with TF-IDF awaiting, uh, which uh, here we're able to get a sense of the causes of anxiety, uh, namely uncertainty, 
about the future, concerns about contracting the virus at a supermarket, um, people not wearing masks, feeling unwell, etc. cetera. Um, compare this to the causes of hope, uh, uh, which uh, include references to getting sunshine, going to the countryside and watching videos with family. Um, so we're able to see some more diverse, uh, diversity in uh, what we're displaying here in the word clouds. Uh, so TFIDF is a common method in information retrieval and data mining uh, to reduce uh, the importance of stop words and also highlight the uh, terms that make a document class unique. Uh, so in our case, we have two document classes, hope and anxiety. Uh, we combine all the hope examples and all anxiety examples into their own, uh, into each uh, two documents. Uh, so uh, from there, uh, we then compute the term frequency, which is the count for each word divided by the total number of words. Uh, and then we calculate the inverse document frequency, which is uh, the log of the number of documents in our case two, uh, divided by the number of documents in, in, where the word uh, occurs. Uh, so it, it's worth noting that this downweights the terms common to both classes. So although family was a key theme in, in both classes, it is no longer salient in this word cloud or the previous one. Uh, so uh, in fact, these are actually completely removed uh, using the formula above. Uh, because the number of documents uh, uh, would be uh, equal uh, to the number of documents total. Uh, so in order to include those, you'd want to add some sort of smoothing factor. And for this, we use the um, uh, word cloud library in Python. Uh, so we included an exit survey to collect some free response uh, 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 user feedback about their experience with the tool. Um, so we heard things like it felt like a friend was checking in on me daily. Uh, that the reflections helped them to reduce their anxiety, uh, that it was easy to do, uh, they didn't have to log into any uh, sort of survey tool. Um, and also, yeah, this, this sense of uh, there was somebody there uh, listening. Uh, and while this feedback was motivational, we also looked at what participants found most challenging. Um, so for uh, example, uh, uh, people, uh, there were some technical glitches, um, that we were able to quickly uh, resolve, um, but those were highlighted here. Um, and then additionally, people had a sense that they were talking to a robot and not necessarily a person. So there's definitely that need for empathy uh, as we start moving into more, more complicated uh, uh, chatbots and uh, to provide virtual therapy via chatbot. Um, <clears throat> also a key finding there was that the Likert type scale was challenging for some users as well. And that's something that I think can carry over for others who are working with tech bots uh, for mental health. <clears throat> uh, so I wanted to close with uh, the lessons uh, we learned, uh, some key takeaways. Uh, so, um, inter uh, so for SMS channels, uh, you need to be able to handle international SMS. And so for that, you need to make sure you have uh, a, a provider who supports international SMS. Uh, also, um, the order of the messages can get um, scrambled if you don't add a delay into your, um, into your uh, channel. Uh, and so uh, our recommendation would be to add a one second delay uh, because too much delay can cause uh, async IO issues. Uh, and also it reduces user satisfaction. Um, so, uh, and no delay at all can have the same effect. So just um, sending out too many messages uh, too quickly can also reduce user satisfaction as well. Um, for international SMS, uh, the cost is, uh, is going to be higher uh, in, in some situations, and that can be much higher. So 533% higher, uh, we, we saw on our uh, outbound messages. And so in order to accommodate for that, we reduced the number of initial messages that were sent out to the bot. So we have a, a basically an opt-in to the conversation each day as the initial message. Uh, so, so that uh, uh, so that we're not um, sending out, you know, three, four messages uh, with no response. Uh, related, we ensure that our daily messages that we send out, we're monitoring whether or not people are replying, uh, and if they aren't replying, then we do stop sending out the messages. Um, we also found that uh, for the conversation design piece, that iconography was a useful method. Uh, for indicating free text versus Likert input fields. And so we didn't see any crossover uh, there. Um, 
for simple use cases, as I mentioned, uh, you can keep the pipeline simple. Uh, this uh, helps to reduce costs, but it also enforces uh, strict conversation flows. If you really want to keep people uh, along a certain um, conversation path, uh, you can do that by removing some of these uh, statistical models that make things uh, more free flowing. Uh, finally, uh, we saw a 80% survey completion rate over the 21 day study, uh, which we uh, found um, uh, to be successful as a success because uh, the values did not change very uh, rapidly day to day. And so we were still able to achieve the purposes of monitoring mental wellness uh, over time. Uh, so that's all from me. Uh, thank you uh, for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Will and Maddie. Um, and uh, we're going to move on to the Q&A part. Um, and I think, Maddie, if you can. Um, oh, you're already here. Perfect. <laughs> um, I, I see your face now. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks both again uh, for the presentations. Um, we have a couple of questions and um, probably would start with the first one um, for Maddie. Um, and so the question is, um, what uh, are your thoughts on using the new GPT-3 model in Rasa? Has it improved compared to using other language models? Yeah, um, yeah, really, really great question. So um, GPT-3 is certainly, you know, really impressive and exciting for sure. And, and it does a couple of things that are great. Like it gives developers and technical teams the ability to build these NLP applications and it doesn't ex exclude them from the conversation. You know, it can generate seemingly coherent text with just a few training examples. And you could use that for like question answering, search, content generation and things like that, right? But I think the, the problem with GPT-3 is that, well, first of all, 93% of the training data is English. So that's a problem if you're trying to build multilingual assistance or a multilingual NLP application. And it's also shown to generate abusive outputs. So outputs that are racist, sexist, and, and abusive. So it, it's definitely something that needs human intervention. So if you wanted to use it for conversational AI, you can. Um, we've, we've had access to GPT-3 and we've tried it out. You know, there's um, our research advocate, Vincent, uh, wrote uh, a, a nice article about GPT-3. Um, Rachel did this great video uh, dressing it down. So, you know, that's certainly something you can take a look at, but conversational AI chatbots need to provide accurate and reliable information. So that's one of the things with generative models is that you can't guarantee the accuracy of the information. Going back to, I think it was like Zed's question about making sure the information was legally vetted, you know, you can't guarantee that with these types of models. Um, and GPT-3 is actually shown to provide inaccurate medical information. So you can use it, um, but if you want to make sure that there's a human vetting the information or supervising it, then it could potentially work. But, you know, conversational AI needs tools and techniques like conversation driven development, which is a process of listening to what your users are saying and making iterative improvements. It needs software engineering best practices because it's just like any other software application. So it needs like testing, CI, CD and so forth. Um, and you can automate certain parts of it, but not everything. So um, yeah, GPT-3 is, is great, it's impressive, but um, I would say if you wanted to use it, just be very mindful about, about the outputs that it's producing um, and, and make sure that you're not automating this entire process of generating text and then serving it to users directly. Um, thanks, Maddie. Um, Will, I don't know if you want to add anything else uh, to that. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I think Maddie summed up pretty well about GPT-3. Uh, there was a, a, a point brought up about multilinguality, and uh, there's been some interesting work recently from uh, uh, fr I, uh, from both uh, uh, BERT, BERT, there's multilingual, multilingual BERT, which I've had success with, uh, as well as um, uh, some cross-lingual language models from uh, Facebook as well. And so if you're looking for um, uh, large language models, which GPT-3 is just another larger language model, uh, you and you're looking to support some multilingual use cases, then I would suggest uh, multilingual BERT is a good option, as well as um, Facebook uh, cross-lingual language model. Cool, awesome, um, thanks. Um, the next question um, is, uh, do you have instructions or guidance on HIPAA compliancy? So for anyone who's 
um, outside of the US, uh, HIPAA is uh, kind of, I mean, I sometimes look at it in a similar sense um, of like GDPR, which I think is much more known. Um, so pretty much restrictions on how you handle uh, medical data specifically. Um, and uh, there's a lot of like regulation around that and for companies like health insurances, um, as well as like, you know, hospital chains, um, anyone holding that type of information. Um, there are a lot of um, restrictions on how you can handle data. Um, I think I can maybe uh, have a first go at this question um, and then uh, the others uh, feel free uh, to jump in. Um, the way how I look at it, and it's actually like mostly informed by our customer base, we work a lot with health insurance companies, is that there are probably like two major like topics around that. Um, one being more like where the like, you know, data is actually stored and, and handled. Um, and I think there, um, uh, what what we've seen is like that companies um, that deal with that type of information want to keep it on their HIPAA compliant servers. Um, and of course, like the big clouds also start to offer HIPAA compliant um, hosting as well. Um, but I think that's that's one important question to ask, like where is the data stored and where does it go through? Um, especially in conversational AI, when you think of like Facebook Messenger as one channel, right? I mean, um, that data is also stored there. So I think that's something uh, worthwhile considering. Um, and back to the text message example from Will, I think that's actually a great, uh, a great more, in my opinion, more secure uh, channel to, to use something like this. Um, and then the other big question I think is more around like, how does your workflow look like as a team? Um, so if you think about like who sees data that is connected to your assistant um, that is HIPAA compliant. Um, and I think there is a lot of like a question around um, like who sees training data, for example, who labels it um, do you have like people that actually should not see HIPAA compliant data in your company? Um, so you might want to find a way to obfuscate that data in some form or the other. Um, and that's really more about like the workflows and like how, um, how we've seen a lot of companies um, thinking about that, how to operationalize conversational AI, right? And we talked a little bit about um, conversation driven development. Um, but uh, in our case, for example, um, Raza X as a, as a tooling um, to do conversation driven development um, also has a has a version that actually makes it easier to assign certain roles to people um, to you know have either like see certain types of data or not um, and so I think that's something um, that is early in many ways but something that we we also see a lot in our customer base um, being asked for um, I don't know uh, Maddie or Will if you want to add anything to that yeah I, I would add uh, at least that the SMS uh, it would not necessarily be HIPAA compliant. So I would, uh, there, I, uh, like I showed, there was like the custom channel uh, code that we had written for ZipWhip and you could do something similar for your own application. Um, uh, there, uh, you would want to ensure that uh, the messages are encrypted uh, and um, that's uh, possible using the HTTPS encryption, but you would need to include some sort of like login mechanism, uh, which uh, the, like you would need some additional middleware there uh, to have logging in and, and authorization for the user. Um, but yeah, I see uh, you, need, you needing audit logs as well for what's, uh, which I think Raza X does a good job of, uh, at least um, who's accessing uh, what data, uh, I believe is, is a function um, um, that, that, that's available. So um, yeah, I, I think, once you get it onto a HIPAA aligned compute environment like AWS, and then you have the uh, external channel, really at that point, you're looking at um, compliance on that encryption and in the uh, logging in. So I recommend looking at some uh, custom channels for your own application, or even using the HTTPS endpoint for Mraz X. Cool. Um... Awesome. Well, I think in that context, also what we've seen a lot um, out there in the wild is uh, people using mobile apps um, where you already have some form of login um, and kind of can authenticate a user and then you build a conversational channel in there. Um, that's also really common. Cool. Um, Maddie, if you want to add anything, just jump in. Otherwise, I would go to the next question. Oh, yeah, please do. Cool. I think whether you summed it up really well. Awesome. Um, great. So the next one um, is uh, which pipeline configuration is better in terms of making accurate predictions? Um, do you have any kind of chart mapping the models to the data set that could be used for that model level accuracy and so on? Um, and I mean, Maddie or Will, um, probably best to start on this. Yeah, I can, I can probably answer it. And I'm also curious to, to hear what Will thinks, but 
Um, so Raza has, you know, both a pipeline and policy configuration that's really customizable. Um, there isn't a one size fits all policy for sure. Um, and we certainly don't recommend that, you know, there isn't like one set of embeddings, if you will, um, that, that always worked better. But we recommend you use a combination of both rule-based and machine learning policies. Um, so right now, Raza comes with Diet, um, which is which is our, our NL, joint NLU model, Diet or dual intent and entity transformer for NLU comes the fault with that. Um, but you could, Diet is, is pretty plug and play. So if you wanted to use BERT within Diet or, you know, or GLOVE or like another set of embeddings, pre-trained embeddings, you can. Um, uh, so definitely try something like that out and play around with it. It's very use case specific. Um, so if you find that one particular set of embeddings or, or model is, is working better for your use case, then yeah, I totally encourage you to do something like that and definitely share the results with us um, in the forum so others can learn from it. Um, we also have the TED policy for dialogue, right? So after NLU, um, the chatbot has to predict the next action or responses. So we have TED for that, which is a transformer embedding dialogue policy. So you can use a combination of these machine learning policies with rule-based policies like the form policy, you know, fallback um, and, and things like that. So there wasn't, you know, one set of embeddings within Diet that always worked better or one set of machine learning policies that consistently worked better. So it's pretty customizable. Yeah, and, and I would add uh, that the, um, uh, with people making type, uh, type, uh, typo mistakes and, and things, uh, it's often important to include like the character level embeddings. Uh, and those are available uh, as like a separate uh, featureizer in Raza, but you can also include the uh, use a model or a language model that uses character level embeddings. And so a lot of the most popular ones nowadays do uh, tend to use uh, those as well. Um, so that's an important uh, thing to, uh, to consider, especially if you're using retrieval uh, actions, uh, because the retrieval actions are doing a, uh, a mapping between the encoding of just the phrase. It doesn't really look too much into the tracker as far as I've been able to understand. And so there it's, it's even more important to make sure you're including um, character level embeddings. Yeah. Lessons. So they can recognize the entities. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, we are running a bit out of time. We only have uh, two minutes left. Um, so maybe one more question here. And, and sorry if we didn't get through uh, the, the remaining ones. Um, but we'll make sure to answer them afterwards. Um, I think Stacy asked all of them anyway. So <laughs> <it's easy. laughs> we're going to find out who, who they really asked. Um, and so, so the, the last one that I have here is like... Um, for our team members wanting to learn Raza and a bit of CDD for the first time, is there any faster way uh, than taking the full masterclass, the Raza masterclass? Maybe Maddie, uh, I think you're the perfect person to answer this. <laughs> yeah, great question. I'm so glad someone asked this. Um, if it was the real Stacy, thank you for that. Um, but we uh, have just launched uh, Raza for Beginners um, on Udemy, it's a free course. So that's uh, an introductory level course that tells you everything about um, what Raza is, how to get started, um, you know, a little bit about CDD in the context of building your first assistant. Um, so definitely take advantage of that and we can provide some more information on Raza for beginners. Cool, awesome. Yeah, then thanks uh, Will for, for joining. Um, thanks Maddie as well. Um, I hope you all stay safe uh, in this crazy world. And um, as Maddie already said, like ping us if you have any more questions um, and we'll share the recording afterwards as well. And uh, I hope to see you in one of the next webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alice.